You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Look for all your equipment needs to be met at McAllister.com. And we are pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You can find Leaders and Legends at All Indiana Podcast Network.com. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guests today are professors and a terrific couple based on everything I've read about them, David and Jeannie Heidler who have a combined five degrees from Auburn University. So uh, Roll Tide is not something you're going to hear Mm -hmm. in the uh, podcast today. (laughs) They have graciously decided to come on because uh, I reached out to them after having just read one of their books. And it happened to be on Andrew Jackson, who remains my favorite president, so much so that I named my son after him, Andrew Jackson Vane. And when people uh, ask me about that, I kind of deflect and say I named him after the sheriff of Mayberry, Andrew Jackson (laughs) Taylor. David and Jeannie, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's a thrill to have you. Thank you, Robert. Jeannie is Professor Emerita of History at the United States from the United States Air Force Academy. Um, She also uh, taught there for several years. Your dissertation from Auburn is on what subject? Uh, I actually wrote a biography of a a general by the name of David Emanuel Twiggs. Uh, He served in in the Army from the War of 1812 uh, up into the Civil War, though he, he died during the Civil War of old age. David has taught at the University of Southern Colorado and at Salisbury University. What was your dissertation on, sir? I wrote a dissertation on the fire eaters, the radical secessionists who were Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, movers and shakers for over 30 years in the attempt to split the union, uh, finally successful by virtue of events rather than their efforts. Uh, they were pretty much shoved aside in the Confederate government that followed because they were radicals and uncooperative by temperament. And uh, all of you who listen to the Leaders and Legends podcast know that I focus a lot on folks from Indiana and from Hoosiers, but um, this podcast has given me a vehicle to indulge my lifelong uh, love of history. And a lot of what you're hearing from the podcast today is a discussion with historians who are very generous with their time. And obviously, as a full-blown history nerd, uh, since I read the Golden Book of World War II before I started kindergarten, to be able to talk to real scholars, uh, personable and professional and brilliant, is a huge. It's a huge opportunity for me, and I'm very grateful. The one thing, though, before we get started on going down the road of history, is how did the American Civil War cause you to to fall in love uh, oh. <laughs> well, uh, go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead Jeannie uh well we we had met when we both started our, our graduate program at Auburn uh in in a class and we didn't exactly hit it off uh but the uh in the spring term we were in a uh seminar on the American Civil War. And 
in the seminar, you got a chance to, to really get to know people a lot better. And, and as a result, we came to know each other better. And, and finally, at some point, toward the latter part of the term, uh, David asked me to go out on a date. And, uh, and, and we did so after the Civil War seminar. In fact, I would always tell my, my students when they would ask how we met, I said that we, we had a great romantic meeting in a seminar on the American Civil War. And they always got a big chuckle. Uh, out of that. And so from that date on, uh, which was about 40 years ago, uh, we have been together. Were there ever any uh, heated discussions over the dinner table or the breakfast table or driving from place to place about Civil War topics or other history topics? Are there are there people or, or subject matters where you guys just flat out do not see eye to eye? I'll let you no. take that. No, we have never had a heated discussion about history. Uh, we reserve those for other aspects of uh, life. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all married couples do. But no, in history, we found ourselves to, you know, attesting the uh, compatibility and durability of the marriage uh, by uh, collaborating. So over decades, we've discovered that... Uh, so far, so good on that. And uh, as a result, we are among those strange collaborators. You know, the story is that Gilbert and Sullivan uh, couldn't stand the sight of each other. Uh, uh, Kaufman and Hart were uh, always more or less at arm's length. Uh, the the uh, uh, relationship between uh, uh, and, uh, Oscar Hammerstein and, and uh, Richard Rogers was somewhat chilly and cold and a purely business-like nature. Uh, we uh, sort of broke that mold and are more in the um, more in the vein of a cooperative collaboration rather than an anti antagonistic one. So uh, it's worked out pretty well. Thanks, thanks for asking, though. <laughs> more, more, more Obama and Biden as opposed to Nixon and Agnew. Well, I one of us has found it. No one of us hasn't been indicted yet. If that's what you mean. <laughs> it's poor poor Spiro, he's under misunderstood. I know, I know what you mean. And you know, somebody asked us, "How do you, uh, uh, how do you manage over the years to keep keep what is the collaboration going?" And our stock answer for many years, people don't understand it anymore, is that we uh, have stayed very far away from Yoko Ono, and. Uh, <laughs> She that doesn't used to be that kind of represent, you know, that kind of uh, uh, reaction. But now that nobody knows who John Lennon is, let alone Yoko Ono. So. Uh, uh, David and Jeannie Heidler have collaborated on several books. Uh, I'll read some of the titles: War of 1812, Manifest Destiny, The Mexican War, Old Hickory's War, Andrew Jackson and the Quest for Empire, Henry Clay, The Essential American where they were interviewed by proud Hoosier and proud Purdue Boilermaker, Brian Lamb on C-SPAN, Washington's Circle, The Creation of the President, and The Rise of Andrew Jackson, Myth, Manipulation, and the Making of Modern Politics. We talked a little bit about the American Civil War as, as a place where you guys met in graduate school. One particular thing I want to ask you about, we just had Brooke Simpson on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, a preeminent Grant scholar. We talked a lot about Grant's resurgence and how uh, not only in terms of his presidency, but also his generalship has received uh, much more favorable reviews in the last 10 or so years. Uh, Jeannie, what's your take on that? Do you agree with the revision or are there still uh, things we don't know? I do agree with the revision regarding his generalship. Uh, I think he, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say he was brilliant, but he, he learned from mistakes better than most generals. Uh, and as a result, I think he, he was a great general. Uh, he won the Civil War uh, with the way he prosecuted it, but first in the West uh, and then against Lee. Uh, I think the, the term the butcher 
is terribly misused, uh, that he, he did what he had to do to win the war, and that if he had not done what he did, uh, particularly against Lee, I think the, the war would have dragged on for years longer. Um, as far as his presidency, um, I think it's a mixed bag. I don't think that Grant was a dishonest man by any means, uh, but uh, my impression is that he was not, when it came to politics, he was not nearly as good a judge of character as he was as a general uh, judging other officers. Um, though I don't think his presidency was a complete failure. David? I agree. It's a, uh, a question at the end of the war of uh, the devil's arithmetic. And uh, the, the North was able to summon more resources and more manpower. And uh, before Grant, no one had been willing to employ that. Uh, they had been cautious or, or what would we call prudent to the point of uh, paralysis. This was one of Lincoln's great, uh, uh, great complaints in that he couldn't, he couldn't find anybody who would really fight the war. Um, classically, when uh, when George Gordon Meade uh, sent the telegram uh, after Gettysburg, saying uh, to Lincoln, saying, "We are driving the enemy from our country," uh, Lincoln exploded. One of the few times he did during the war, completely lost his temper, and said, "It is all our country. Do they not realize that?" And Grant realized it. He fought the war like it was all of our country. And uh, when he left on the Overland campaign and said to, to um, uh, Lincoln, I will fight it out on this line if it takes all summer, uh, Lincoln finally knew he had his general. <clears throat> and uh, with the exception of Cold Harbor, where Grant was quite mistakenly informed the uh, Army of Northern Virginia was about to shatter and and did that headlong charge against fixed positions, something he never repeated. Uh, with the exception of that one morning, uh, the campaign is rather masterful uh, in terms of tactics and strategy. So I agree. I think the revision of him away from the butcher who just threw men like cannon fodder at, at the enemy is, is, uh, is wrong and it needs to be revised to appreciate the things he did at Vicksburg, uh, at uh, at uh, the the outset of the and the close of the Overland campaign. So, I used to give speeches to Civil War roundtables around the Midwest, and it's been several years now. But one of the things that I said about Grant was, well, there are lots of things. Uh, he had a terrific sense of humor. Uh, they once asked him if he could whistle and he replied yes i can i know two tunes one is yankee doodle and the other one isn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> but he he gave lincoln continuously wanted three objectives to end the war liberation of east tennessee free navigation of the mississippi river and the capture of richmond slash destruction of lee's army grant gave him all three received the surrender of three separate armies. So when you look at the totality, not just of the Civil War, but of American history, my humble opinion is Grant's the second greatest general of all time behind Washington. David, where would you put place him in that, in that somewhat uh, subjective pantheon? Well, I'm not sure I would even put Washington in the great general. Um, Washington was a magnificent leader of men. Uh, his sense of strategy, tactics, his sense of, of uh, battlefield opportunity was um, lamentably, lamentably limited uh, on a number of occasions. He learned, but he never broke into the brilliant uh, ranks. Grant learned, uh, <clears throat> but I would say, as was Washington, Grant qualifies as a grand leader of men. When, um, when they had fought at Spotsylvania in the wilderness for, for days upon days and um, looked like it was a draw, 
and the uh, the muddy they were covered in mud spirited our army of the potomac received their orders their marching orders and it was to head to the <clears throat> to the south uh, east uh, the, a cheer uh, rippled through the army physical that could be discerned from a distance uh, because every other time that they had fought uh, days upon end, they had always received word to fall back uh, to positions of safety, refuge, and re recuperation. And this was not that kind of general, and they realized it, and they realized they were going to die under him uh, in significant numbers. They also knew the people who survived would have won the war. Jeannie? Uh, oh, I, I will have to disagree just a little bit with David regarding, uh, with regarding Washington. I think the one thing that he realized very early on that, that made him in some ways a strategic genius is that he realized that as long as there was an American army, there would be a revolution. In other words, that it would continue. And the longer it lasted, the better the chance that the, the, uh, the British would grow tired, which is exactly what happened. He knew that he could not, particularly early in the war, win a lot of battles against the British. But he knew that if he didn't lose his army, the, the war would go on. And I think that that was his genius. One of the books from David and Janie Heidler is Washington's Circle, The Creation of the President. Now, I noticed in the title, it's not The Creation of the Presidency. Why did you choose that title and this particular focus, Jeannie? Well, we chose this particular focus because no one had ever really looked at Washington through the eyes of the people around him. Uh, he didn't do this by himself. He, was, he couldn't have done it by himself. Uh, that he had a lot of people uh, who were very bright, some of them brighter than others, most of them brighter than George Washington, if you, if you really looked at it objectively. Uh, though in many cases they were uh, uh, more self-serving than, than George Washington. But that that ability of his to have people around him who were more talented than he was in many ways uh, was a great asset to the government. A lot of people are not that self-assured, are not that confident that they don't want to have people who are smarter than they are around them. Uh, but that, that's not something that threatened Washington. And so that's why we took the approach that we did. Is it, is it fair to say, and it, it's a terrific book and a lot of the books that I've read about that time period or the presidency of Washington is a, he created it out of whole cloth. It just, it didn't exist. And so he, he had a, a different burden than, than a lot of his successors. Um, certainly not, I wouldn't say as big as Lincoln, obviously, but just having to create it himself. But eventually he and Jefferson had a falling out both from Virginia had known each other for years Jeannie, just describe kind of how Washington and Jefferson grew apart and what role Alexander Hamilton played in that separation. Well, I think philosophically they grew apart. Hamilton was certainly a part of that uh, because I think philosophically uh, regarding the, the powers of government, what government could and should do, Washington grew to be uh, more in agreement with Hamilton than Jefferson. Jefferson. Uh, had had his uh, doubts about the Constitution. He wasn't in the country when the Constitution was written, and he was concerned from the very beginning that it, it gave the central government, what became known as the federal government, uh, too much power at the expense of the states and the, the citizens. Uh, but he was willing to give it a chance. And as he came to know Hamilton, he became increasingly worried that uh, the states particularly would be 
uh, more or less abolished. I mean, there was a concern that what Hamilton, and Hamilton actually said this at one point, uh, that he wanted to make the states into more or less administrative districts. Uh, and that was something that, that frightened Jefferson because Jefferson philosophically believed that the government that was closest to the people would be better able to protect their rights. A distant government in a faraway capital in New York or Philadelphia, as it was under Washington, uh, that that distant government would not protect the rights of the individual citizens. And that Washington seemed to be listening more to Hamilton in this regard than he was to Jefferson, uh, caused Jefferson to, to break with the president. I mean, he resigned. There wasn't a formal break uh, until later, and, it, and both of them tried to more or less act like that hadn't happened. Uh, but I, I do believe it was a philosophical difference. David, is it fair to say that Hamilton enjoyed his intellectual jousting with Jefferson, especially when he had the opportunity to remind Jefferson that he owned slaves and that Hamilton was a man of freedom from the North, quote unquote. I've read articles that say we are living in Hamilton's America. Is that a accurate, fair, disillusioned? How would you, how would you describe that statement, that assertion? Well, uh, the, the, uh, that is true to the extent that we live in a world that is, uh, uh, America has always existed in a, in a state of cognitive dissonance, of uh, aspiring to an ideal while um, embracing another. And uh, we, we all want to have Jefferson's America, uh, but we have wound up with Hamilton. And the, uh, the good or ill of that has been debated uh, ever since these two were jousting, as you say, and continues to be. I don't think we'll ever really come to a conclusive um, uh, end to the, to the, to the uh, dispute between the substance of their ideas or the way that these, those ideas have been presented. The issue that you mentioned earlier about their having a, a parting of the ways in the cabinet wasn't so much over slavery as it was over something that was fundamental in Hamilton's relationship with Washington, which is that they both served in the war. Right. And Jefferson didn't. Uh, Jefferson never wore a uniform. He was the author of the Declaration, which no one knew. Uh, for, for a number of years after the event. And he had, uh, he had served as a, when, after he did that, he went home. He, he went home to Virginia, which he thought was re uh, the real uh, job of the revolutionary generation was to put uh, local houses in order, in his case, the state of Virginia, and participated in some fairly extensive and, and ambitious projects, such as the recodification of all the statutes and laws uh, to remove them from the influence of the crown and make them more Republican instruments. But he was also the governor of Virginia at one of the worst times of the war when, uh, when the war came to Virginia in the, in the body of Lord Cornwallis and Benedict Arnold and, and Lafayette uh, fighting uh, a, a rather uh, unimpressive uh, resistance effort against Cornwallis and Jefferson having to flee the capital of, of Richmond and, um, and ultimately flee Monticello uh, when, when uh, chased down there in a sort of an ignoble retreat that his enemies never let him forget. And Hamilton always remembered. And when things got a little dicey, Hamilton wasn't above bringing such things up. Um, and in fact, had a, uh, had a lever in doing so on Washington's opinion, uh, not just from the personal view, but the, the fact that the people who served in the revolution in uniform, like Washington, Hamilton, John Marshall, uh, Henry Knox, those people had seen horrible hardships inflicted upon the army by virtue of an indifference in Congress, but also 
a sense of localism that refused to put together a national coherent effort, even to the point of supplying troops. And Washington was always resentful of that. And uh, in as much as there was that residue of opinion between centralism and localism as it fell within the national government under the constitution, Washington increasingly tended to go to the central view. Uh, and that put him at odds with almost all of the Virginians in his orbit and certainly in his cabinet, including uh, Edmund Randolph at the end, mm -hmm. so that we have what is obviously a system, a situation that is headed toward collision and disagreement. It doesn't occur, it's inevitable because of the nature of these men's different experiences and their attitudes that were borne out by them. I build this podcast uh, not only to sponsors and friends and hopeful listeners, and quite frankly, to people uh, to whom I send correspondence to say, hey, come on and let's talk about all the things you've done and you know, and hopefully help you sell a book or two. Uh, I build a podcast as something that I want to be informative, entertaining, and comfortable, which is why we eschew modern politics because it doesn't really fit any of those. But I will ask this question as scholars. Washington is certainly someone whose reputation is starting to take and whose track record is starting to take even greater scrutiny as quite frankly as Jefferson's. Jeannie, what do you, how do you assess that? In other words, is it and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is it a situation? Well, okay, these are all the bad things, but the totality of Washington's record is worthy of respect or does his uh, slave owning uh, plantation and that life where he, he was tough on his slaves and he didn't, he freed him on his, in his will, but he, he clearly was not interested in manumitting or some large emancipation effort. Is Washington greater than just that, or does that one fact sully his reputation and life so much that we shouldn't get past it? I don't think we should necessarily get past it, but I don't think that it so sullies his record that we should ignore all of the important, great things that he did. Uh, now, as far as his manumitting, I think he did want to. And in fact, there are letters to that effect that he he thought of a number of different schemes uh, to, to perhaps uh, sell his farms. He was very interested in doing that and leasing them out to uh, uh, immigrants, uh, particularly from the British Isles, to come in and operate farms on a smaller scale. Uh, it was something he was interested in. He just couldn't figure out how to do it, practically how to do it. Uh, uh, he was concerned about the slaves once they became former slaves, um, that he was concerned that they would not be able to support themselves because slaves who were freed in Virginia had to leave Virginia by law. Uh, and that is something that, that concerned him as well. But he, he was not um, an easy man to work for, uh, either as a slave or any other kind of subordinate. Uh, that's one of the reasons why he went through so many overseers, uh, is that none of them really did the job the way he thought it should be done. He was he was a tough person to work for in government, in the Army, and at Mount Vernon. Um, but as far as the great things that he did, I think he, they, they deserve to be recognized and honored. As I heard someone, and I can't remember, David, you might remember, Someone said the other day that, that I read that uh, we don't build monuments to the bad things that people do. We build monuments to the good that they did. Uh, and I think he did a lot of good in establishing this country and keeping it stable at a time when no one in the world thought that the United States mm. could survive. Uh, he established that stability uh, that that others built on, including Jefferson, later, uh, that that has allowed a government that everyone thought was an absolute wasted experiment 
to not only survive, but to thrive. David? Yes. Uh, there is no United States of America without George Washington. The revolution likely does not succeed as a military project, and the government does not succeed as a political one. Without, this, uh, without his stabilizing influence and his towering prestige after the war, the constitutional experiment simply would not have survived. Uh, we would have been rent originally and initially by the same kinds of forces that ultimately did rent the United States in the middle of the 19th century. This goes back to the slavery issue. Uh, Washington very much wanted, he found slavery distasteful. He always had. And he found it uh, to be uh, distasteful morally, and he found it crippling economically. Uh, his switch in, in Mount Vernon to uh, away from labor intensive crops, away from tobacco and cotton into things like wheat, uh, made him, uh, uh, made, made the books wacky in terms of turning a profit with the place because he, was, he, he had too much labor. And he, he refused to sell it. He would not sell and he would not separate families. And as a consequence, he was, uh, he, he was uh, faced with a, a moral and a practical quandary that he um, was not alone in, uh, in, in uh, finding insurmountable and insuperable. Washington's ideas about leasing farms and keeping the mansion house, leasing farms to immigrant laborers on a tenant basis was, uh, was a quiet project that he honestly believed he would pursue given the opportunity and time. The problem was political as well as, as economic because he represented a national vision for the country which by virtue of the Southern uh, dependence on slavery, which was growing and would become uh, economically and socially, uh, uh, socially difficult to, to address. Washington was worried that by being a symbol, his hands were tied and dealing with the moral conundrum, that if he did the wrong thing, he could, he could kill the country. And so he, he had to weigh almost everything he did on the basis of his reputation and its worth as a credible legitimizer of the constitutional experiment. And that's why when he left office and went home and had that glorious two years away from public life for the first time in his life, he was a different person and he was thinking constantly about how he was going to address this issue to make Mount Vernon morally uh, morally uh, good and economically viable. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Find all your equipment needs, both sales and rental, at McAllister.com. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guests today are married historians, which I don't know that I get to say that uh, very often. It's David and Jeannie Heidler. They have written some terrific books. I just finished one. It's called The Rise of Andrew Jackson, Myth, Manipulation, and the Making of Modern Politics. They've written numerous articles, and you can find their works and their posts because they update uh, pretty regularly at djheidler.com h-e-i-d-l-e-r they've received numerous awards and recognitions including from the daughters of the american revolution distinguished book award society for military history distinguished book award they've received starred reviews in booklist and publishers weekly 
And their book reviews have appeared in the Washington Post and the Journal of Military History. One of the areas on which they have written extensively is what I believe is an area of history which is called the Early National Period. I had a professor actually at IEPUI named Ralph Gray, who was uh, one of the first people to write extensively about that. In the earlier early national period, you can define it different ways, but nearly all the definitions include uh, mentions of the exploits and leadership and impact of several great men. One of whom they wrote about is Henry Clay. I once asked George Will, the conservative columnist who I happened to see at a conference one time, at a political conference, who would be his Mount Rushmore of the greatest Americans who have never been president? First name out of his mouth was Henry Clay. Jeannie, Henry Clay was enormously impactful in so many different ways. But he was also, if memory serves, a five-time loser, one way or the other, in his quest to be the President of the United States. If you had to sum up quickly, and I know it's tough, Henry Clay's impact on the United States then and his role in trying to forestall what eventually became the American Civil War, how would you do it? Well, he had a a lot of accomplishments. I could just recite a list. Like, for instance, uh, he established the position of Speaker of the House as a powerful position, uh, which it had not been before he became Speaker. Uh, The the position had been really just more of a uh, referee uh, during congressional debates. Uh, And he actually made it into really the uh, more or less the modern speakership. That, that was obviously a big impact, and that in itself would be enough to, to discuss him. Uh, but I think his, his dedication to the Union, particularly as the sectional crisis became more intense, uh, and the things that he did to try and prevent uh, rifts uh, between the North and the South, uh, are probably his greatest accomplishment. And he's known as the great compromiser, which we, we kind of disagree with that, uh, partly because he would never compromise on the union. He was not someone who was a politician first and then a statesman second. He was a statesman first. Uh, and his, his refusal to compromise on the sanctity of the union, uh, I think was his, his greatest achievement. And the respect that people had for him in government and out of government uh, is, are the reasons why he was able to, to keep the union together for as long, long as he did. And, and for instance, you can see the respect the American people had for him. If you just look at some census records from his lifetime, the number of little boys who were named Henry Clay Jones or Henry Clay Johnson or Henry Henry Clay Frick, to name a, a famous one. Uh, he was one of those people that that one of those leaders that the people naturally look to to save the union. The other person I want to bring up uh, quickly because I find him one of the two or three most fascinating people in American history. That's Andrew Jackson. On the, on the hierarchy of hate, where would you rank the Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson hate fest in American history, Jeannie? Uh, It's right up there. Uh, I think you would probably put it up there with the Jefferson Hamilton uh, hate fest. Uh, I think Jackson hated Clay more than Clay hated Jackson. Uh, I I think Clay was puzzled by Andrew Jackson. He was puzzled by Andrew Jackson's appeal. Uh, I'm I'm not saying that he liked him, but he, Clay was one of the, uh, a politician, and he was a politician, a gifted one, who was always willing to let bygones be bygones uh, if, if the other side was willing as well. Uh, and, and Jackson, that was not, that, that was not part of his makeup. Uh, when you became Andrew Jackson's enemy, 
uh, you were his enemy for life. Now, he could put it aside temporarily if he needed something from you, uh, but but you, you really never left his enemies list once you were on it. Uh, but but they did. They disliked each other intensely. Although I would say that Jackson came to hate Calhoun, John C. Calhoun, more than he than he hated Clay because he saw Calhoun as a traitor to him, whereas Clay was just always an enemy. And Calhoun was Jackson's uh, first vice president after having yes, served as vice president under John Quincy Adams. So is the is the uh, declaration from Andrew Jackson apocryphal when asked if he had any regrets and he said i regret <laughs> i'd not hang john C- shoot henry clay or hang john c calhoun did he I, say I, that? He did. I, I don't think he did say it he certainly said similar things in his lifetime but he i don't think he did say that but if it was ever proven that jackson regretted not shooting the uh speaker of the house or hanging his own <laughs> vice president you wouldn't be surprised <laughs> No, I would not be at all surprised. David, we talked a little bit, uh, Jeannie did, about Clay's sort of amazement or befuddlement at Jackson's appeal. Obviously, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president who, uh, I hate to say, beat Jackson in 1824 because he didn't, but who won <laughs> the president, was was given the presidency 1824. Let me ask two questions very quickly. For the rest of his career, Clay suffered from being perceived as a participant in the quote-unquote corrupt bargain, and it's something that he knew was going to be staying his career at the time. At the same time, Americans tend to love men on horseback. We've already mentioned two of them, Washington, Grant, obviously another one would be Eisenhower, but right there is Andrew Jackson, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans, and, and, uh, somewhat of a imperialistic general, as he uh, showed from time to time down in Florida and other places. What is it about the man on horseback in American history that just seems to be something that appeals to the voters? Well, it's a man of action. And uh, you, you've hit on something, and, and, uh, which is a sort of a bleak, reality that occurred in the 1820s. And it was something that Henry Clay didn't understand because he found it unpalatable, uh, which is the man on horseback. Uh, We have in the Constitution a system uh, for the executive that pretty much makes him passive in domestic affairs. Uh, He is uh, he's armed with certain powers in terms of foreign policy which are uh, discreet to his office and, and branch of government. But for the most part in domestic activities and affairs, he is an observer, uh, a check on uh, irresponsibility, uh, but almost all in Washington believe this, almost all volition should come from what he Washington called the first wheel of government, which is the legislature, Congress. And uh, the, every president succeeding Washington believed that. Uh, Jackson did not. And Clay anticipated that as a source of trouble, not just from Andrew Jackson, but within a rede- re- redefinition uh, of the executive as a vigorous, aggressive presence. That very much resemble the very thing they fought against in the revolution, which was a monarchical presence, accountable only uh, to himself within a cult of personality. This is the reason that the Whigs, uh, which was Clay's party founded by him in response to Jacksonianism, the Whigs took that name, which was the loyal opposition uh, in the 18th century, which formed up against the uh, Hanoverians in the, on the throne of England. Jackson tapped into something that was remarkable and then had the, had the coincidental characteristics and uh, reputation to make, to, to make the most of what he tapped into, which was a general dissatisfaction with the direction of the country and the belief 
that the political class had grown either indifferent, aloof, or both. That, I think, fueled a good deal of the Jackson, Jackson surge in 24 and, uh, and kindled an increased resentment after 1825 when it, when it was, whether right or wrong, became broadly perceived by deliberate, uh, uh, by deliberate propaganda that, that Adams and, and Clay had conspired to steal the presidency. In other words, that they had acted on the establishment assumption that they knew best and that they would not let the people have their voice. And that voice was Andrew Jackson as the political operatives on his side were able to persuade. And that made 1828 almost a surety that, that Jackson would win that election because it was a reaction that Jackson Jackson capitalized on rather than created. And the only creation going on in that was very shrewd measures, manipulations in the political camp that he uh, headed that was able to, uh, that, that these were able to make uh, people aware that something was very wrong in Washington and that Andrew Jackson, the man on horseback, settled problems resolutely and quickly, and he was the person to fix it. 1824, we mentioned John Quincy Adams, and you guys, please correct my history, but John Quincy Adams has served as Adams had served as Secretary of State to President James Monroe and had served phenomenally as Secretary of State. He's universally regarded as one of the best, most able men to hold that position. I think John Quincy Adams, in terms of pure brain power, is probably the smartest man, most intelligent man to ever serve as president. I don't know if this is right, but I think I'd read where he was he was reading Greek and Latin at the age of three or four. He was son of John Adams, the second president. Uh, in 1824, Jackson uh, leads the Electoral College and leads the popular vote, uh, but he does not gain the necessarily majority. Clay is uh, thinks that he's someone who can put Adams over the top in the house and they have a meeting and subsequent to uh, history clay becomes secretary of state in john quincy adams administration the jacksonians immediately cried foul and said it was a corrupt bargain so david let me ask you real quick was it corrupt was it a bargain was it neither no it was not corrupt and it was not a bargain under the constitutional prescription, the House of Representatives has the sole authority in the absence of an electoral majority to choose the president of the United States. And how it does that is, uh, is, is a uh, formula, a process that has happened, uh, that had happened before in a contested election between Aaron Burr and, and Thomas Jefferson. And the, uh, Procedures, the protocols, and the precedents were put into place exactly by the people who had lived through that earlier event and put it into place with the understanding that when it was over with, the person who won that, won that contest in the House would indeed be uh, President of the United States. Not acting, not uh, illegitimate, not a pretender, but the President. Now, the issue of, of bargaining brings into question the very way political activity occurs. Uh, we, we can uh, complain about that, but it is, it is the, the reality of how political stuff gets done. The Jacksonians, Jacksonites, as we, we call right. them in 24 and 25, they were bargaining as, as, vigorously and as aggressively as they knew how uh, with, with the delegates outstanding, bringing to bear pressure and uh, dangling baubles of favor and office in front of whoever they could have dinner with, that they were bested <laughs> on it uh, in the process of the, of the whole bargaining uh, ballet by, the, by Clay and his, his, uh, his minions 
it's just sour grapes. And that's something that Martin Van Buren always said. He never believed the corrupt bargain nonsense. He was willing to use it, but he never believed it. They could play people who were better at it. And so he, he, he found that something to learn from rather than uh, just uh, uh, condemn uh, with, the, with the whole club. The other part of it is that it was not corrupt. Um, Adams, uh, we know that Clay was going to support Adams when he left Kentucky. We know that before there was any meeting. The only thing that kept them from, uh, kept Clay from announcing that and kept Adams on tenterhooks was the fact that Clay wasn't aware of Adams' real positions on certain of his uh, policy projects, such as the American system, banks, tariff, and, and protective tariffs. He was uh, quite anxious to probe Adams' attitudes about those things before he publicly uh, threw his support to him. And Adams, uh, we can look at that and say, who was he going to make Secretary of State? Who was available, who he knew had the uh, diplomatic experience that Henry Clay had? He had observed him firsthand while they both served on the commission to negotiate the Treaty of Ghent ending the War of 1812. So it's a logical choice. Clay, for his part, uh, was reluctant to accept it at first until he was persuaded, I think, by compelling arguments, that to turn it down would let the Jacksonites have their way. And that if they, by merely threatening the, uh, the possibility of corruption, could in fact staff John Quincy Adams' government by their preferences, then the whole point of the election was gone and wasted. And that, I think that is a valid and, and as it happened, unfortunately valid point. <laughs> Jeannie, you mentioned someone a few minutes ago. Am I, am I wrong in finding John C. Calhoun particularly loathsome? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, not not in some ways. I, I think what happened to John C. Calhoun is that as, and he, again, like John Quincy Adams, he was a supremely intelligent human being, very well educated, uh, really did see himself as smarter than everyone around him. Uh, and And he was encouraged in that by some people, some of his supporters. And as a result, he developed into a, a horribly uh, ambitious man. Uh, we, you, you mentioned Clay running for president five times and losing. Uh, Calhoun wanted to be president more than anything in the world. And, and as a result, you see shifts in his beliefs. Uh, as a young man, as a young politician, as a young man in government, he was a, a supreme nationalist, an ally of Henry Clay in that. Uh, and then he, he shifts to become uh, an increasing supporter of states' rights and, of course, the father of nullification. Uh, and, and all of that, I think, in many ways was tied to his ambition. Uh, and in that way, I think he does come across, uh, particularly when you look at some of his private letters, uh, as loathsome. Uh, because he, he says one thing to one person and another thing to another person. Um, I think he, he was almost driven mad by his ambition. Uh, and that, that is, that's a, it's a very dangerous thing to be as ambitious a, a person as John C. Calhoun became. John C. Calhoun was a member of Congress and eventually served in the United States Senate. He's from South Carolina, was a member of what was called the War Hawks, the, the Young Bucks who supported uh, American action and what became the War of 1812. And, because Jackson is one of my heroes and, and you know, you can't, can't really find a lot to admire about his sworn enemy or one of his Jackson had a lot of Jackson woke up on vibrate. So he had a lot of, uh, a lot of sworn enemies, uh, especially if they were British, then, then he really hated you. But anyway, of all the acts associated with the American civil war, one that I find particularly loathsome is the fact that John Tyler, 
the 10th president, was actually elected to serve and would have served in the Confederate Congress had he not died. To me, the difference between Clay and Calhoun is I could see Calhoun serving in the Confederate Congress. I could not see Henry Clay doing that. Jeannie, am I onto something or no? No, he would not have. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, it is conceivable if he had not developed tuberculosis that he could have been alive when the Civil War broke out. Um, and no, he would not. He would have, he would have opposed secession, as did his protege, uh, John Crittenden, uh, senator from Kentucky at, at that time, during the, the Civil War. Um, now, his family was divided. Uh, one of his sons was a staunch Confederate sympathizer, uh, where his his other two sons, living sons, were not, and particularly one of them uh, served uh, as a diplomat in the Lincoln administration. Uh, but no, he would not have been. Uh, Calhoun, I think, if he had been alive, yes, he would have, he could have. Uh, uh, he may have been elected president of the Confederacy, who knows? <laughs> He wants to be president so bad. I imagine, <laughs> imagine the country is kind of incidental. Abraham Lincoln is famously a clay man. Lincoln born in Kentucky as a Whig and then joins the Republican Party when it's formed in the 1850s. But I've read a lot about Lincoln, as many people have, and he seems to be an admirer of Jackson's stance in what was called the Tariff of Abomination or the tariff issue that threatened civil war in the late 1820s, early 1830s, where Jackson famously just threatened to hang everybody in South Carolina. He's just going to hang everybody, starting with his own vice president, John C. Calhoun. <laughs> Is Jackson, let me say this a different way. Jackson receives a significant amount and is probably in some ways the foundation of why he was always rated in the top 10 presidents for survey after survey after survey, and I understand his reputation has taken more of a hit these days, but it seems to me that the foundation of Jackson's successful presidency to the extent that it was, was his stand against disunion and treason and the way he showed incredibly indomitable leadership where there was no mistake what was going to happen. Is he worthy of this praise, Jeannie, or is it something where his hagiographers hey, kind of made him out to be someone who kept the union together. No, I think he is definitely worthy of, of that praise. Uh, the way he stood up to Calhoun and the nullifiers uh, was a model to Lincoln. And I think that's what Lincoln was looking back at, uh, as you said, that uh, Lincoln would not um, offer a lot of compliments to Democratic presidents, but Jackson was different. Uh, different from all of the other Democratic presidents in the pre-war period in that he did stand up, even as a Southerner, to the nullifying movement in South Carolina and the threats at disunion. Uh, even so much as to ultimately agree to a compromise tariff proposal, the architect of whom, what, which was Henry Clay. Right. So he was even willing to support Clay's compromise uh, to prevent disunion, at the same time rattling his sword, but also being willing to accept a more diplomatic solution that Clay had put forward. Uh, so, no, I think he, he did a masterful job in, in diffusing the crisis, but also making it very clear that he would not tolerate disunion. If he had a reason, and then I want to ask I want to ask David about something in, that really fascinated me in the in your latest book about Andrew Jackson. But if Andrew Jackson had a legitimate reason to hang John C. Calhoun, do you think he would have done it? No, I don't. Uh, I think he was enough of a politician to know what kind of fracture in the country that that would cause. Uh, and so, no, I do not think he would have hanged John C. Calhoun. I mean, Calhoun was in the Senate. Uh, if he could have come up with something, he could have laid his hands on him, uh, but he didn't. And I, I think he, he knew better than to do that. What would, what would, um, 
What would Andrew Jackson be like on Twitter, Jeannie? Oh, I'm afraid he might be pretty vocal on Twitter. <laughs> Maybe we're uh, the comparisons, and I know you all have written about this between Trump and Andrew Jackson. To me, are always been significantly exaggerated, but I think they are very much exaggerated. Uh, but Andrew it, Jackson it on Twitter hard. would have been yeah. that would be fun. It was hard for his his handlers to keep him quiet when he had a strong opinion, as you saw when you read about the campaigns, keeping him quiet was their hardest job, particularly in the 1828 campaign. Um, and so that I think that it, they were lucky there was no Twitter. And the keeping him out of DC, like he'd want to go there and they were like, no, just, just stay in Tennessee, stay away. <laughs> and, and let me say this for anyone listening. If you have not visited the hermitage, uh, Andrew Jackson's home down in Nashville, Tennessee. Please do so. I've been there about three or four times. It is a beautiful place. The, his, the history is presented in a, a phenomenal fashion. Uh, if you like that time period and just like that area of the country, the Hermitage is well worth a day trip from here, from Indianapolis. David, the last question to you before we get on to the five questions that we ask every guest in reading The Rise of Andrew Jackson, your latest book, and I will post uh, the Heidler's website on uh, Facebook so you can see all their books and order from there. But one of the things that struck me that was the, the part that I hadn't read before is the importance and the rise and the proliferation of newspapers as a way to get out the message, these partisan newspapers as a way to get out the message of the parties and the candidates and certain points of view. 1824, 1828 seems to me to be kind of like the boom, like, okay, now every, now this is starting to make sense how the newspapers became so important in the 19th century. Talk to us, please, about the importance of newspapers, what they wrote about, and how this era late 1820s, early 1830s, was a springboard to what became perhaps more infamous decades later, and that's the yellow press around the late 19th century. Yeah, uh, Robert, this is interesting, as you point out, because what happens in the 1820s is we have a, uh, a communications revolution that is analogous to what we are experiencing with social media and uh, and the internet. Uh, while it was not instantaneous, the telegraph was not in play in the 20s, the technology was uh, growing increasingly sophisticated so that newspapers were able to uh, achieve a, a, a greater volume. Uh, the presses were more sophisticated and more facile. And, I mean, at the presses as physical producers of printed pages. And the... Uh, and the structure of the mail system, which was designed to educate voters to create a more cohesive and coherent informed political class in, among the ordinary voters, that in conjunction with the increase of those voters through the widening franchise and the information given to them through uh, these, uh, these channels, uh, newspapers primarily, uh, meant that the people who controlled the messages in those papers controlled the opinion and ultimately the, the behavior in the ballot box of wide swaths of voters. And this was new, new enough for them not to really understand in certain quarters the importance of it, with the result that you have people like Clay Crawford Adams writing letters the way that people always did. They wrote letters to a few influential folks in a, in a state who would then get the word out among their network. And that network of a very limited uh, voter base, because there were very limited numbers of voters, would then decide elections. But in 1824 and 1828 especially, because they honed this and perfected over the four-year period between 24 and 28, we have a massive program of informational control that is astonishingly disciplined on the part of the Jacksonite movement. So that messages are vetted by central committees down to local committees and implemented in 
various things like newspapers, rallies, uh, gimmicks like hickory sticks for old hickory, uh, images uh, reproduced either as woodcuts or actual um, uh, metal etchings. And uh, over it all, a relentless hammering of a central message that is artfully various, but at its core, uh, very disciplined and focused and concentrated. A few editors across the country formed what essentially were campaign managers, and they used their newspapers as campaign documents. There was no, there was no pretense, except for sort of the, the uh, nod of vice to virtue, that this was an, a nonpartisan effort. The newspapers were uh, organs of a particular candidate, and it just so happened, as with the bargain uh, with Adams and Clay in 24, that they were better at that. The Jacksonites proved to be superbly better at that control of information with the newspapers in the course of the, the lead up to the 1828. Jeannie, the subtitle of the book, uh, The Rise of Andrew Jackson, Myth, Manipulation, and the Making of Modern Politics, the last part of that, how did the rise of Andrew Jackson make modern politics? Well, I think probably the most important thing that was done, particularly between the election of 24 and 28, a little before uh, the election of 24, is that uh the candidate, Andrew Jackson, was, and I don't want this to sound too harsh because I don't mean it that way, but in many ways he was manufactured. Uh, his image was manufactured uh, for the American people. There was plenty about Andrew Jackson that his campaign managers could use, uh, particularly his, his heroic efforts at New Orleans. But there, there was also a lot of things that had to be at least either brushed over or changed in meaning uh, because Jackson had done some questionable things, uh, particularly as a young man. Like killing uh, people? Yes, like killing people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and those, those things had to be, if, if not airbrushed out of the picture, at least softened. Uh, and, and that is one of the things that they were able to do. And, and po political managers, they've been doing it ever since is that the candidate that you, you now see on television is not necessarily that person uh, it, as that person really is. Uh, and they, they became so good at it in the 1820s that no one could really ever hope to be elected again without using those techniques. So there, were, there was a mythology created about Andrew Jackson, his sainted mother, his sainted wife, his, uh, his, his adoption of the, the infant Lincoya, all of those things had to, to be put in place to create this somewhat mythical person. And people's ideas had to be manipulated about Andrew Jackson. And there were a lot of people who were not in favor of Andrew Jackson in 1824 who jumped ship whatever ship they happened to be on in 24 and became Jacksonites in that intervening period. Uh, and those people, they either had to make a conscious choice or their views of Jackson had to be changed. Uh, and modern politics as a result was born from these, these things that these people did, particularly for the election of 1828. In 1824, Jackson loses to John Quincy Adams. In 1828, he defeats John Quincy Adams. In 1830. Two, he defeats Henry Clay. And you know what? That's not a bad way to end this podcast as a, <laughs> uh, a more Jacksonite than Jacksonian, perhaps. Uh, but I want to thank our sponsors one more time, and then we're going to ask David and Jeannie our five questions. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bowes, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bowes Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, 
and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. David and Jeannie Heidler, PhD historians. Are you ready for the five questions? Yes, I suppose so. I didn't know about this part. Well, that's because you're not supposed to know, (laughs) but I promise they're they're harmless. And we'll do ladies first uh, for each answer. So what was your first job? Oh, gosh. My first job was I was a cashier uh, at a uh, lunch counter in downtown Atlanta. David? I uh, worked for an agricultural uh, outfit that had uh, that maintained uh, silos, uh, grain silos. And uh, one of the things that I occupied my day with was replacing silo buckets by going into a fairly hot, this was summer, and fairly hot uh, uh, tube and pulling down the conveyors and using a wrench to take the silo buckets off and then putting up uh, reattaching new ones uh, because they took quite a beating in the operation of putting the grains up into grain elevators. And as a result, uh, they needed to be changed out uh, periodically. And that was my job. That was the, it was, it wasn't uh, terribly mentally challenging and it was very <laughs> uncomfortable. But it paid uh, honest money, and it was honest work. Jeannie, what was your – and maybe this is going to be a joint answer. This is the first husband and wife team we've had on, Chris, unless my memory has failed me. But, Jeannie, what was your first concert? Oh, goodness. I think it was the Eagles at the Omni in, in Atlanta. Hey, that's not bad. Yeah. David? The Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, uh, Arthur Friedler, who you might remember. Yeah, for the Boston Pops. That's right. He was the guest conductor. And uh, he still had a good bit of his career left, even though he was elderly when I saw him. And then they played Lafayette's The Three-Quarter Hat, uh, the 1812 Overture, some, you know, very popular selections. Grieg, uh, the piano concerto. I don't remember the soloist. But I was quite young, and my aunt took me. Uh, uh, she was a season ticket holder and she got me into the loge and I remember it almost like it was yesterday. All right. These next three are tough for you guys. Um, given your profession, third question, Jeannie, if you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? Oh my, Oh, oh gosh, that is hard. That's very hard. Uh, and I'm not going to suggest one of our books. Uh, Why don't you go ahead and do that? <laughs> uh, I, you know, David Donald's biography of Abraham Lincoln, I think, is one of the, the better biographies written. Uh, and David Donald has gone to his reward, so he won't even benefit from this, this endorsement. So, but I, I think that that would be uh, an excellent introduction to that period of American history. David? Uh, <clears throat> Mark Twain's Life on the Mississippi. Uh, most people choose Huckleberry Finn as the great American novel, but there's something charming, innocent, and uh, evocative about this young man's uh, experiences on the river as well as his, uh, his learning the trade of riverboat pilot that is, uh, has elements of Huck Finn and, and the uh, sort of innocence of, a, of Scout and Jim and To Kill a Mockingbird all rolled into one with, with, with Sam Clemens' ability to, to tell a great story. His description of a, of a sunrise over the Mississippi in like 300 words is worth reading the entire book alone. Number four, Jeannie, if you could witness any event in history, which event would you choose? Hmm. Yeah, these are kind of uh, unfair <laughs> for yeah, you guys. Well, I, I could think of a lot, but I, I, it's something that did just pop into my mind that I would have loved to have actually seen, and that is the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. And, of course, he wasn't even there, but the surrender of his army at Yorktown. 
October 19, 1781, Cornwallis wimps out and won't face George <laughs> Washington when he surrenders his army. David? You know, that was sort of mine. I, uh, I <laughs> something that I would like. But you know what I would, like, would have liked to have seen? I would have liked to have seen the discussion, which we know nothing about, but had been in the room with Adams, Jefferson, Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Livingston talking about the Declaration of Independence, going over the rough draft of that and hammering out exactly how they were going to, uh, to, 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 to hone the words and revise them to make them more effective more in, and even more persuasive. I think that would have been a fascinating afternoon to watch those things go on because it had to be done fairly quickly. Jefferson had produced a draft and these men were involved in the, uh, in the approval of its language and, and, and form and that would have been something to see. One of the greatest edits of, of all time, not just the United States history is the change from life, liberty, and the pursuit of property to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which I believe was Franklin's uh, suggestion. They say so. Yeah, that uh, property was Locke, and uh, happiness is Franklin, which is kind of suitable. <laughs> 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 Last question, Jeannie. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours, completely off the record, talk about anything you want, whom would you choose? Living. And so it has to be a living person. Correct. Oh, I think I would like to have spent two hours with President Trump. To try to figure him out, to try to... Yeah, to try to figure him out, to try to, to if he would be completely frank, what he thinks about everything that's going on, I, if, I would be interested to hear his views. David? Well, presuming I would be part of that dinner party no. as well, <laughs> the two hours that you let me come along and, and sort of just listen. Uh, that that would uh, that would remove him from the list uh, by default. I don't know. You know, it's more interesting to to think who would you like to have dinner with, who whoever lived. Uh, uh, you know, who I would have loved to have had dinner with, just to talk because I think he was an extremely honest and uh, delightfully frank person in his views and his attitudes and his language was Wilfred Brimley. I'm sorry that he is gone and that I never got a chance to meet him. He died just a few days ago. And That's right. So I, I'm an admirer of his work for it being sort of Wilford Brentley in various settings rather than real characters. And having gotten to know him by virtue of that, I think it would be nice to know Wilford Brimley on a personal level just for a couple of hours of talk. Well, his career peaked in his appearance on Seinfeld. Uh, for oh, and you know, you know, uh, Robert, that's never mentioned. They always mention mm -hmm. the natural, and they mention the Our House series thing. You know, where he did the thing with uh, uh, with uh, the, the young lady who later went on to be uh, in Charmed and all that. I forget her name, uh, Shannon Doherty. Mm -hmm. uh, but they never mentioned the Seinfeld uh, uh, episodes where he was supposed. To Postmaster. <laughs> he was actually, wanted. he was terrific in the movie, The Thing with Kurt Russell. Yeah, he was, you know, he was, and he's the one who, when he sits down and does the mathematical progression, the, the exponential progression of the, of the thing. Right. And he is able to do it in a way that is absolutely terrifying in the, in the matter of fact way that he finally comes to an end and tells where this thing will go in, in abundant volume then everyone on screen, of course, is slack-jawed, and I think everyone in the audience is as well. <laughs> Our guests today on the Leaders and Legends podcast, David and Jeannie Heidler, uh, two terrific historians. I love their work. They write terrific books, and you can tell by spending the last few moments with us, they're incredibly engaging and gracious. Thank you both so very much for coming on the podcast. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, 
please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Thank you.